focus on cloud, location, data center, industry, trends, the dynamic market. Hey, I'm David Liggett with Data Center Hawk, and I am so pleased to be joined by uh, Bill Fathers. Bill is the CEO with CoLogix. Bill, uh, great to see you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, David, and look forward to the chat this morning. You bet. And this is one of, you know, I've shared this with you before, but this is one of the, my most favorite things I get to do. We talk to indus, uh, data center industry leaders. And so before we jump in, I would love to hear about your background and how you got into the data center industry. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think professionally, I've been in infrastructure software or infrastructure pop proper for the last probably 20 years. Started out in infrastructure software in the financial services industry, a company called Thomson Reuters. Um, and the challenge there was to get market data as real time as possible onto the desktops of uh, professionals in 80 or 100 different countries around the world. Uh, and so I was in the sort of software part of that company that was trying to work out how you did things like uh, you know, distribution of global content. We started spending a great deal of money with people who own things called data centers and people who ran fiber optic networks. And quite quickly, I realized that that looked like a nicer business than the one I was in. Uh, and so <laughs> made the transition to actually work for a company called Savis, uh, that was the underlying network and data centers that supported a great deal of Thomson Reuters global distribution. And then spent seven years at, uh, at Savis, which is a, a, at the time a public company. We grew our global network and increasingly became more and more focused on, uh, on data centers versus network or managed services over time, and then moved into um, infrastructure software again at VMware, uh, doing hypervisors, software-defined networking, just as the global public clouds were starting to really take off as well. So was also responsible at VMware for relationships with Amazon, Microsoft, Google, and others to embed that infrastructure software. Uh, and after that, went into private equity and thought, right, this time, I'm going, to, I'm going to learn to invest in infrastructure um, and try and identify basically with the thesis that the public cloud players are clearly going to drive an awful lot of the growth here. Let's see if we can find opportunities to invest uh, in, in the critical points there. And that led me into working for a private equity firm, which I still do. Uh, and one of the investments we've made was into CoLogix. Um, and for the last couple of years, I've also now uh, run and operate CoLogix as the CEO. So on the way, I spent time on the board of a couple of companies that were very influential, Telex, which was a very uh, ecosystem-centric uh, data center provider, and also Sienna, uh, the, 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 the maker of underlying fiber optic infrastructure, which again was really useful to see where that was trending as well. Anyway, so long story short, I spent a lot of time in infrastructure and applications, and I'm interested, you know, professionally in the impact that the public cloud players are having on the massive growth of infrastructure globally. Yeah, and it's it's certainly happening happening today. One of the interesting things I think about CoLogix is, uh, you know, how the company has transformed over the last several years. Uh, you know, has obviously a very rich focus on, you know, densely interconnected facilities and really helping. Um, be the home and, and the area where companies will come and, and find the value of, of network and interconnectivity. And now there's also been a, a focus on being able to serve the needs of some of the, the cloud providers that you mentioned that are looking to grow their footprints in larger uh, uh, scalability uh, or larger focuses from a scalable standpoint. Talk about that process and how uh, CoLogix is looking to grow moving forward, focusing on both of those type of, of users. Yeah, you, you articulate it very well. So yeah, the value proposition to customers at CoLogix hasn't changed really since the company was founded just under 20 years ago. It focuses on very network dense, carrier neutral, uh, carrier hotel type facilities across North America in Canada and in the USA. And customers come into our data centers for two reasons, which you, both of which you touched on. One is because they want to get access to the dense network of carriers. And the other is they want to connect with each other because there's some attraction between the two companies in the data center that mean they want to interconnect with each other. And as you say, although that, that value proposition hasn't changed, public cloud is the application and, and now the community of interest that dominates all, most aspects of, of, our, of our customer base. So over the last five years, we've transitioned from having predominantly carriers being our top 20 customers, all of whom are still there and they still grow nicely with us. But they've now been overtaken by the, the cloud service providers uh, who all now, you know, increasingly the, the sort of Amazon, Microsoft, Google, Oracle, Alibaba, IBM software. So they're the ones that initially 
deployed their customer on ramps um, into most of our facilities. And as you know, some of them are going faster than others in the speed with which they do that. And as you alluded to, the next wave of content we're seeing from them are as they increasingly look to deploy storage or compute resources closer to customers, uh, we see them branching into cities like Vancouver, Montreal, Columbus, Minneapolis, uh, that, that are markets that you know are outside of the top 10 in North America, but now they've achieved sufficient critical mass to mean it's worth them deploying. And they all have their own words for it, don't they? Azure, Edge, uh, Amazon <laughs> Outlook, you name it. But that, that's, the, that's the wave of demand that we've seen as well. One of the interesting things about CoLogix too is, and, and you hit on it for a moment there, is is the the experience that the company has and the and the facilities that you have in Canada. I mean, you have a you have obviously a very uh, notable portfolio in the U.S., but you're also well positioned to handle growth taking place in Canada. And it's one of the things from Data Center Hawk's perspective that we've seen over the last you know twelve to twenty four months is a significant increase in certain Canadian markets that. Uh, companies are looking, public cloud providers are looking to get more mature. And talk about Canada, how you got into that market and why you feel like it's so important. It was one of the company's very first acquisitions was to acquire the Carrier Hotel facility in Montreal. In fact, it was the second company we ever bought. Um, and from there, we then grew into Toronto and then into, into Vancouver. And for the first five or six years, our primary focus was just dominating and owning the Carrier Hotel environments in each of those three markets. The next phase we went through was to say, well, actually, we can start to add some annex facilities in Montreal. Uh, we could add some annex facilities in Toronto uh, and then in Vancouver as well. Um, Montreal has the added benefit of being, as you know, the lowest costs of electricity in the world and the most renewable source of electricity. It's under four cents US a kilowatt. So it's about 3.2 cents a kilowatt uh, for power in Montreal. And it's obviously very, very, very renewable. So we've kind of gone Montreal crazy. So uh, not only <laughs> we, we sort of we now have three carrier hotel facilities with with over eighty five uh, of the of the the key carriers that come in either transatlantic through Hibernia you know, through uh, Halifax, or they're the, the the key hub for interconnecting down into New York. So it's a major interconnection hub. Um, we then built five and now actually seven annex facilities in the suburbs of Montreal. And we also then got into what we call hyperscale edge, which is where we're looking to accommodate workloads between five and 50 megawatts for hyperscalers who say, actually, I'm going to put a big amount of compute and storage there. And I care about how close I am to, uh, to, to the carrier hotel facility because there's some latency sensitivity in the traffic that's going through there. So we acquired a company called Colo D a couple of years ago um, who have that knack and that skill of knowing how to build you know, uh, incredibly big, efficient data centers that exactly match the very fast changing needs of, of the hyperscalers. So we, we have a team that came from Colo D that are really good at interacting with uh, the sort of buyers within the large hyperscalers and interacting and understanding their design and being able to come up with, and that's proliferated. So we're now, uh, as we speak, we're actually, um, we have four new um, 30 megawatt plus built to suit facilities that we're building for uh, the hyperscalers in Toronto, Montreal, and one other market, Columbus in, in the US. And, and overall, the Canadian market is has just exploded in the past year. I'm not quite sure what it is. You've probably seen it as well. But uh, we, you know, we're basically seeing 40% growth this year in Canada relative to last year, which is you know, it's it's typically been uh, you know a 10, 15 percent growth. Yeah, a lot less. And yeah. suddenly, it's in the 40, 50 percent growth, which is which is astonishing. Yeah, and I think that's the value of the, you know, international portfolio or obviously being able to have uh, or more facilities than, you know, just the U.S. I think a lot of the things that we've seen over the last five years in the United States obviously is now starting to happen in Canada. We're starting to see that in Europe and in Asia. Um, and, uh, you know, I think for the next three to five years, that growth from our perspective will continue. Talk about the U.S. for a moment. You know, you mentioned Columbus um, you know, you will also are focused on some other markets. Y'all recently made an, an acquisition in Minneapolis. And so there's certainly uh, some things happening in the U.S. Talk about that for a moment. Yeah. Um, so I'll just start with uh, Columbus. So Columbus is a very centrally located spot that has beneficial tax uh, treatment for data centers. And as a result, it's attracted uh, Google, Facebook and Amazon who have built upwards of 600 acres of data centers there in the past five years, as you probably know. Luckily, although we'll claim it's skill, 
uh, Cologix for some time has developed and owned the Carrier Hotel facility, which are our first two data centers in that market. And as you'd imagine, the traffic now surging through the Carrier Hotel facility has, has ballooned in the past few years. And that in turn has made Columbus a more attractive magnet. And off the back of that, we built a 24 megawatt uh, sort of annex facility there that in turn has attracted things like sort of uh, large gaming platforms, the ones that are owned by the big global cloud service providers um, and, and other sort of very latency sensitive workloads as well that are, that are starting to, to pick up there. The other thing about Columbus is it's become a mecca for remote working, i.e. what we've seen is a lot of the big global tech companies have decided they're going to be remote working through the pandemic for two to four years. And they've built remote infrastructure uh, centrally in the United States. And we've had a couple of them now building 10, 20 megawatt infrastructure within our footprint, which is just to support their employees worldwide, which, which is interesting. Uh, Minneapolis is the other place where that, that's actually our fastest growing market in terms of interconnection growth, 48% year on year growth and in interconnection. And that's just, it's kind of the combination of we host all of the cloud on ramps. There's quite a bit of OTT content in there, i.e. the Netflixes, the Hulus, the Apples, um, and there's, there's a decent financial services uh, market there as well. So you've got three ecosystems all fueling more and more interconnectivity. East Coast, New Jersey, uh, which continues to grow well for us. We're, we're uh, deeply entrenched into Halsey in terms of an infrastructure, sorry, interconnectivity. Jacksonville is the cable landing station, um, which you may know, which we host in our facility in Jacksonville. Uh, and then round to Dallas, where we're in the Infomart facility, and we tend to be um, we host a lot of, again, the big global cloud service providers. We have an equal number of carriers in the carrier hotel there uh, as, as the other main provider in that building as well. So that, and that kind of rounds out our footprint. You, you mentioned the Infomart. Why, why do you feel like connectivity has become so much more important in the you know, B2B world for sure, but as businesses think about their infrastructure and the applications that they're offering uh, and the services they're, they're offering to, to customers, from your perspective as the CEO of Cologix and, and talking to customers, you know, all the time, why has that become so much more important? It, 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 is, it is the key moment in any sales conversation with a customer. We, we start brandishing our, you know, merits in terms of the number of carriers, the cloud on ramps, the access to an internet exchange. And if at that point the customer's face starts to glaze over and they say, I, I don't know, I don't care. And, and by the way, we're expecting <laughs> 75 bucks a kilowatt. We know we're in exactly the wrong conversation. <laughs> but if they say, ah, okay, great. Have you got these five providers in at 100 gig and is the Amazon on-ramp in your facility? I keep talking and go, this is going to go well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it is a very binary thing. There are customers that care and there are customers that don't. And we don't do what's called a worship sale. If they don't care, we don't keep going. So it is, sure. it is quite a, a defining moment in any conversation. But I think it's, you know, obviously there's the born in the cloud companies, the SaaS companies for whom connectivity is clearly everything because that's their distribution channels and their customer base. There's the myriad of industries that are now putting a lot of their applications in the big public clouds. So their perhaps customer databases of record need to be in close proximity to their customer, the, the other applications they're using to interact with customers. And they, they see the merit of it being close. Um, yep. And obviously that gets, you know, a lot of waffle about hybrid uh, models gets discussed at that point. Um, so I'd say, you know, to your point, the customers who are quite advanced in their journey to the public cloud uh, and digitization of, of all of their applications uh, tend to come in quite well informed and are quite specific about how close we are to the on-ramps. And it's increasingly the on-ramps they're asking about, not the carriers, because one infers mm -hmm. the other. Uh, but have you got Amazon? Have you got Azure? Have you got GCI, GCP? And are you near our soft layer? Tends to be now one of the filtering questions, I would say. And Infomart's a good example. Um, I would say that we have three data centers there. The first one is probably 50-50 customers who really care about connectivity and half enterprises who bump, bumbled in and were happy to pay more than they'd have paid in the suburbs. And, and now in our third facility, it's exclusively people who are deploying edge nodes, cloud on ramps, or, or have got explicit multi-cloud strategy. I would say. In fact, I'll, I'll track back from that. I still don't see many clients with multi-cloud strategy. I see a lot of customers who tend to go in with one of the public cloud players and they have a small yeah. backup plan. I don't, I don't see them genuinely distributing workload across multiple clouds. That's interesting. Uh, how has the pandemic impacted, you know, we're six months in, if you're watching this, you know, we're six months into this COVID-19 uh, situation that the world is in. How has this impacted, you know, the company from your standpoint and, and what do you think this will do to the industry moving forward? 
the short term, I think we're just coming to the end of that first wave of demand yeah. is just generally up significantly. We're up 46, 48% from cloud service providers, 30, 35% from carriers, 30% up from SaaS providers, and a little lower in terms of enterprise adoption of data centers. So the net is we're up, but it's been you know a case of some, some are buying a lot more and a few are buying a little bit less. Um, and we've seen that first wave of upgrades to sort of accommodate the first snap demand of, of capacity that the providers, the, mainly the cloud service providers and the carriers were a little bit caught out and needed suddenly a bit more capacity. Um, we're now seeing a second phase of sort of industrialization of this. We're seeing them say, okay, this wasn't a one-off blip that's going to disappear. This now looks like a sustained increase in requirements. So let's build capacity accordingly. Um, that's manifested itself for us for two, two things that we're seeing happen. Firstly is the global cloud service providers who typically like to build, you know, varying levels of percentage, a lot of data centers themselves rather than buy the capacity. They have definitely hit a limit of how much they can build and they can't build enough. So we're responding to more inbound RFIs and requests for, to build data centers dedicated to cloud service providers in our existing markets that, than we've ever seen. So we, we have bids for over 350 megawatts of new capacity that we're, we're potentially building, and they're all dedicated for individual cloud service providers, which is rare. Um, and the second thing is, you know, I'd say the carriers are starting to, you know, have to make a lot more investments to just to keep up uh -huh. with this. Um, and that, that's turning it. I think there are some carriers who've got the capital on their balance sheet to do so and others that don't. So I suspect there may be further consolidation here as those with strong balance sheets can keep up and make the long-term investments needed to, to keep growing and others who perhaps don't have the capital and will just do okay, I think. But so anyway, so it's, it's got, and in terms of the ability to service that demand, I think we've been very lucky in all of our markets, data center operators like, like everyone else have been ascribed as mission critical infrastructure workers and yeah. have been able to come to work and do what they need to do. Um, the, the, I'm sure the same for every data center provider, the, the, the work and dedication of the operators in the data centers who are adhering to social distancing, they're having to use PPE on a daily basis, they've accommodated changes to shift patterns, they're doing more remote uh, hands than they'd ever done because we obviously try and uh, ask customers to only come to the facilities if it's absolutely necessary. So we're doing more of that. And, I know you might think that's a profit center, but it's not really. We don't, you, <laughs> sure, know, yeah. you, don't you don't make much money from plugging stuff in. And it's not what we do, but we, we're happy to yeah. do it. So they're, they're pretty exhausted, actually. You know, I'd say that that's six, seven months in, you know, and we're, we're thinking about our shift patterns and our staffing models to say we could be doing this for two or three years. So let's be yeah. sure we're not burning people out. Um, so yeah, that's good. It's gone incredibly well. The employees have been, you know, rock stars. Um, and we haven't actually had any, uh, any community spread at all. But, but I, you know, I'm conscious that, that that is something that you have to... We, one, one of the things we've instigated actually as a company, which is sort of unheard of, is we actually take days off. So we've introduced every three months, the whole company takes a day off, apart from obviously the shift workers who, sure. who accommodate that day somewhere else in their schedule. But we found that the intensity of home working and accommodating odd shift patterns and hmm. constant use of PPE and just watching the sure. news all the time. It just wears people oh, yeah. down. So we found yeah. having an extra day off every three months, so far, so good. Uh, yeah, so, so far it's, it's proven to be quite popular. Well, that's great. And it sounds like, you know, just as an industry as a whole, I mean, you mentioned CoLogix as a company. I think it's been really um, rewarding to see our industry serve the the greater you know world well uh at this time and obviously that will need to continue but um that's been really uh you know fun to see our industry succeed like that um from your perspective you know you have you have a very interesting background you know over the last 20 years um what do you think will be the biggest uh impacts to the data center industry over the next you know three to five years i mean we obviously talked about some of the things that are uh, that will be impactful from the pandemic. But what are some of the other technologies? And you know, we hear a lot about 5G in the market. We we talk a lot about you know the edge movement in the data center industry, uh, and, and that taking place more and more. What are some of the things that you think will directly impact this industry? I think the the first and biggest driver is going to be obviously the growth of the public cloud platforms um, and the technology they're using. Will, will really now increasingly dominate and shape the, the data center market and what, what services you need to provide to, to, to meet their needs. Um, 
and that's you know that means really four companies on the planet are shaping or five probably if you include the chinese cloud service provider are shaping the demand whereas historically it was a range of industries that would shape various needs but now it's really just four or five companies that are going to shape 80 percent of the demand um, and i think as they continue down their journeys around you know con constantly pushing the envelope on, on their compute capabilities on their storage and of course they're, they're years ahead of everybody in terms of virtualizing network you know i, I think that they will increasingly drive as you say a, a slightly more distributed model so we will see you know increasing footprint heading towards smaller data centers because they can economically they can they can now pull it it used to be that you had to centralize it to make the economics work now right. I think they've got to the point where they can make it work in much smaller uh, nodes 5 10 15 megawatts so i think you will see that distribution um and then you know the other thing is around networking so i think um obviously cloud has really come to compute and storage in a big way networking we're probably at stage one in a 10 stage journey in terms of just replacing most of the infrastructure that's in place today with, with just very very low cost hardware and software so that's this you know they're only 10 percent on their journey towards virtualization and automation but the network providers are going to go through now the one thing that won't change is the need for lit fiber and you know that that, that luckily mm. will remain for a long long time but uh, but i think increasingly that's all the cloud service providers will want is either dark or possibly lit fiber um, so, you know, I think the network providers within themselves are going to find huge change. And, and increasingly, I think the cloud service providers will just become the network as well. There's no reason why, uh -huh. in some cases, there's no need for an entity in between a cloud service provider and an enterprise that the network provider, you know, and, and data center companies, obviously, like ours, are increasingly going to fill some gap there in terms of virtual connectivity. Uh, between multiple cloud platforms and enterprises. So anyway, so that's, that's there's a lot, a lot going on, isn't there? And you know, just generally, I think the last year we've seen SLAs from the cloud service providers go up quite significantly in terms of hmm. they seem to come down in terms of you know we just want it low cost and high efficiency but low SLA. That's reversed. They all now um, for various reasons are now I think driving increased levels of SLA. So that's going to put more perhaps emphasis on technologies that will help with higher resiliency that don't require redundancy because we you know it's not lost in any of us that building four of everything just because one of them doesn't work efficiently is, is there's probably a better model than, than gaming reliability <laughs> by buying four of them and stitching them sure. together and having switches that, that then that then could break so yeah yeah no that that makes sense you know to the um to professionals that might want to get into this industry you know, you've, you've been in this industry for a long time, but w what would make it appealing for them? Like when you, when you think about the future of the data center industry, what gets you excited and what would you tell someone that's considering potentially coming into, you know, the data center industry, the infrastructure industry, why should they do that? Yeah, I think the eighties was about the financial services industry and in terms of growth and, and runway. Um, and you know, yeah, the, the oil industry had its moment in the 1970s. Um, this era is going to be around data center and infrastructure. So, um, you know, I think if you look at sort of the, the graduates now coming out of the, of the top schools who previously had considered, you know, uh, careers in banking and, and private equity, uh, then they, a lot of them started looking at the Facebook, Google, uh, uh, et cetera, of this world. I think this next phase is going to be about the underlying data center infrastructure. I've heard somebody say it was a good analogy that, you know, data center, data infrastructure is the, are the railroads of the 21st century and and you know the, the 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 quality and the efficiency of data infrastructure in a city is obviously a main indicator of, of the gdp and the potential economic growth of that market as well as proven in some european markets where they still are struggling to get broadband consumer broadband levels high mm -hmm. so it, obviously there's, a, there's a, a key linkage there so you, you're in you know this is the era for d digital infrastructure the growth I can't see a sort of end to the next, this wave of growth. There will be one, but I can't see it at the moment. The, the, the tailwinds are so strong. Um, and, you know, I don't think you can go far wrong, even if it's towers, if it's small cells, uh, if it's mm -hmm. data centers or fiber in the right markets, all of those are going to be increasingly uh, attractive. Um, and then you've got to work out which function you want to be in. Do you want to be an engineer? Do you want to be, which is interesting. Do you want to be someone who's in operations or perhaps in sales and marketing? And I think, you know, all three are going to be probably interesting careers. Um, interestingly, I think this year, we as a company are hiring our lowest level graduate percentage. So we're increasingly taking people straight out of school 
and, hmm. and training them for three years sure. rather than seeing them graduate and then you know adapt to whatever they've learned for three years uh, come into play. So it's our highest ever percentage of just non-graduate tr- uh, recruits, which is interesting as well. But yeah, um, but it's, it's quite a tough sell, David, isn't it? Because my kids still fall asleep when I explain what I do. So I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm painting a good picture, well, but it's... Yeah. Absolutely. Well, one of the greatest things that's happened to us, our kids play Fortnite. And as Fortnite starts to load, one of the things it says at the bottom is connecting to data center. So both my kids saw that and they said, Dad, that's what you do. I said, that's right, guys. I mean, we're helping your world exist. <laughs> well, Bill, I want to say thank you so much for uh, being on our, our uh, video discussion. We really appreciate your insight. Uh, CoLogix you know, continues to grow. You can learn more about them at CoLogix.com. Um, and Bill, we are so excited to see CoLogix grow in the future. Thanks, David. Thanks so much indeed. 